Hey everybody, good morning, or I guess good afternoon, or good evening, or good night, uh, whenever you guys are listening to this, but uh, good day. Today is a solo podcast, and I want this to be the most beneficial, most important solo financial podcast that I have ever done. I have been a student of finances and money and money creation and the history of money for many years now. Still have a lot to learn, but I believe that we need more financial education in general for every single person that lives in the United States and the world because we truly need to understand what money is and what currency is. I definitely want people to go out and research this for themselves. Uh, My understanding might be slightly different than uh, what it actually is. You know, that's one interesting part about learning and education is that I understand things in a different way than you're going to understand things. But let's go through some of the differences here. Now, if we were to break it down into something simple, money could be something that is tangible and a store of value. So a really good way to think of this is, uh, and I actually love how Robert Kiyosaki puts this, he talks about how silver and gold is God's money because it's found in the earth and it's elemental and it's here. We can mine it, but there is a limited, uh, a limited amount of it. So silver and gold, you could think of that as money. Money can be a store of value, and that store of value is important. Now, I also believe that Bitcoin is a store of value. Now, people might say, well, but it's not tangible. We can't touch it. Um, It could go away if there's an EMP, but there's several properties of Bitcoin that, that in my opinion, make it uh, money. One is that it has a completely limited supply. It will only ever get to 21 million and it also has a diminishing supply so every four years the amount that is mined and released to the public is cut in half money actually has intrinsic value because you're holding it it's it's in your hand now you might say well but i can hold a dollar in my hand but the problem is and we're going to get into this a little bit more later the dollar is de-pegged from silver and gold. So dollars are just fake money. And and, and it's hard for people to understand because they're like, it's not fake money. I can go and I can buy stuff with it. But if you look at the charts from 100 years ago versus today, the dollar's worth nothing compared to what it was back then. And especially if you look from 1971 on when we truly took away the gold standard, uh, inflation and the value of the dollar is it's it's insane it's really sad um, so money is going to refer to the actual value of goods and services that it's traded for so now let's chat about currency a little bit uh, currency cannot really be a store of value because the currency that we have today does not have a peg to some asset like silver or gold. Um, If you put your money in a bank, you're like, well, it is a store of value because my money is sitting in that bank and um, I can pull it back out. So I'm storing that value. But the problem is what happens with inflation? Right now we're hitting a double digit style inflation. Well, that dollar really isn't storing your value. It's actually going down in value. Uh, Currency is just a medium that we keep in our pockets to increase our purchasing power and make everyday payments in our lives. But that doesn't mean that it's money. It used to be when we were pegged to silver and gold. And currency really doesn't have any intrinsic value. You know, silver can actually be used for something. Gold can be used for something. Copper can be used for something. And really, Bitcoin can be used for something. You could even argue uh, real estate in a way 
I mean, maybe this is out there, but real estate in a way is money because it is tangible and can be used for something. Now, currency is the form of money that is circulated in the public, but that's tough to even say in that regard because it's not money anymore. So now let's get into the history of all of this so that we can understand why there's a difference between money and currency and why that's important to us today. There's an incredible book called The Creature from Jekyll Island, which sounds like some horror story, uh, but it's, ab it's about the creation of the Federal Reserve System by a guy named G. Edward Griffin. Now, this guy is an incredible historian when it comes to the creation of the Federal Reserve and really understands the difference between uh, money and currency. Uh, so this book discusses the creation of the Federal Reserve System, which is the central banking system of the United States. There are several chapters in the book, and we're going to actually go through each chapter, just kind of a summary of each chapter so that we can really understand the creation of the Federal Reserve System and how it can affect our lives. So Jekyll Island is uh, an island off of the coast of Georgia, and it used to be kind of like a resort for rich people, uh, kind of a hunting, hunting resort or something like that. Well, in 1910, there was this meeting, including some very important people. So one was Nelson Aldridge, uh, Henry Davidson, Frank Vanderlip, Paul Wahlberg, uh, Benjamin Strong, and Charles Norton. And these men were very wealthy and very powerful. And they went there to discuss the creation of a central banking system, which was kind of against everything that had been in the past. They had tried some central banks, but it didn't really work because of what central banks can do. Uh, they have a lot of power, and when they have power, then they can manipulate monies, manipulate currencies, and uh, bad things happen. We'd seen that happen uh, really since the creation of the United States, since the Constitution was ratified. A couple central banks had, had been tried and failed. Some founding fathers were for central banks, and some were extremely against central banks. In chapter two, it talks about Henry P. Davidson, who was a partner of J.P. Morgan and Company, and we all know who J.P. Morgan is. It dives into how Davidson believed that it was essential to have a central bank to control the financial system of the United States. There were certain very powerful people that wanted this to happen for certain reasons, and there were all of these banks that were competing against each other. So when they're competing against each other, what happens? Some make money, some don't. <clears throat> it's the capitalist system, which at the time wasn't really socialistic like it is today. And uh, they decided, hey, this is kind of a bad idea because we're all competing against each other. So how about we get together and let's draft a bill? And Paul War Warburg, now I'm pretty sure if you hear about Daddy Warbucks and Annie, that's Paul Warburg. Uh, so he set out to draft the legislation that would become the Federal Reserve Act, and it created the Federal Reserve System. He had a very close relationship with President Woodrow Wilson, and that's how it would all work to ensure that the bill was accepted. Continuing on in the chapters, in chapter four, he talks about how the name of the game is bailout. And it discusses how the banking industry desired a government-backed guarantor to bail them out of financial panic. Now, that's not how systems should run. It's not the government's job to bail out really crappy business people that are making really bad decisions that are hurting the public. And in the panic of 1907, that was really the catalyst for the banking elite to push the creation of the central banking system. In chapter five, it talks about them drafting the, the blueprint for the whole thing. So uh, many banking elites held many secret meetings to structure the Federal Reserve System, and then they were able to get together 
they were able to go to Jekyll Island and really <clears throat> uh, and hash the system out. And they wanted to model it after Germany's banking system, which is crazy because Germany's banking system at the time was the mark. And uh, what did they do? They printed themselves into oblivion. They just continued to print and print and print until you hear the stories of of wheelbarrows full of currency being brought to grocery stores in order to get a loaf of bread, which is just insane. It moves on into chapter seven and discusses the money trust, which was a group of Wall Street bankers who controlled the financial system of the United States. The chapter discusses uh, money trust is the cartel was designed to benefit the elite at the expense of the average American. So think of a cartel, you know, a bunch of drug smugglers get together and they're like, hey, we could either compete against each other and kill each other, or we could get together and make a ton of money. That's exactly what happened with the Federal Reserve and these central banks. They got together so that they would never lose and this was at the expense of the American people, at the expense of the American taxpayer. And who wins? The 1%, the elite. Insane. Now, the word conspiracy is brought up a lot nowadays, but this truly was a conspiracy. The Federal Reserve Act was passed in 1913, but before that ever happened, a true conspiracy was set into motion by bankers and politicians to bring about the central bank to the United States. It was a group of individuals involved for pushing the central bank for their ultimate success. Chapter 10 is really interesting because it talks about this uh, idea called the Mandrake Mechanism. And it details how the Federal Reserve creates money out of thin air through the process of fractional reserve banking. So banks really only need to maintain a fraction of their deposits in reserve and the rest can be loaned out, effectively creating new money. So that's how new money is created. The bank only had to have a certain amount of money in the bank in order to loan more money out, and then they would get that from the Federal Reserve, and that's how money is created. Now, I believe that used to be 10%, and I think now it's nothing. They can just literally make money out of thin air. Now, if you think about it, what's going to happen? When you just start creating money out of thin air, what does that do to the value of the dollar? So I made a video the other day called... Uh, the dollar is dead and uh, put it out on Instagram. It, it has like 60,000 views and it is insane how many people are, one, just attacking me personally, even though they don't know me, calling me a complete idiot and saying that the dollar is not dead. Well, look at the charts from the last hundred years and tell me that the dollar is not dead. You used to be able to buy a loaf of bread for five cents. What is it today? Well, to me, when you see the value of something, go down by 98, 99%, it is dead. In chapter 11, it talks about the Federal Reserve has the power to set interest rates. They have that power. It's insane. Um, that has far-reaching effects on the economy. It, it explains how the, the Fed manipulates interest rates to achieve certain goals and often makes deals with politicians and other special interest groups. Just look at today. The whole economy is teetering on, are they going to increase interest rates? Are they not? Are they, are they going to? Are they not? This should be up to individual banks and individual people in order to maintain a free market system. But instead, we have a centralized planning system that is completely in control of all of our economy. Now, the power that the Federal Reserve has is insane and immense. It's led to a lot of corruption, a lot of abuse, and this cartel, uh, it benefits at the expense of all of us. I believe that we need complete transparency and accountability in all of these large systems because we know that when you start to get certain elite people in power, and it doesn't even have to be elite, you get certain people in power they're going to start to make poor decisions, and those poor decisions translate out to all of us. This is such a, a long book, uh, but I definitely recommend it. You can listen to it on Audible. I think it might even be on 
on YouTube. Uh, but it's also so good to have a physical copy because who knows what's going to happen here in the future. So I want to continue to reiterate that not a lot of people wanted this system and didn't really uh, approve of it. Uh, but it was done in secret. Uh, the, the whole Jekyll Island thing was by a whole bunch of really mm, elite people, but nobody wanted this done. So there was tons of opposition, and it really was done kind of privately and in secret. And usually when things are private and secret, they're not always the best. So President Woodrow Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act into law on December 23rd, uh, 2000, or 2000, uh, 1913. The Federal Reserve Banks were established and the Board of Governors was appointed to manage the system. Now, it's important to remember that the Federal Reserve is not part of the United States. It is not federal and it has no reserve. I heard someone say once that it is about as federal as Federal Express. As the central banks of the United States <clears throat> and the Federal Reserve were given power to create money and credit, it didn't take long for the Fed to get involved in government debt and to start manipulating the economy. In Jekyll Island, the idea that a central bank could stabilize the economy was promoted by uh, Paul War Warburg, like we said. He was that key figure in the creation of the Federal Reserve. Now, interestingly, his family was already involved in banking in Europe, and they wanted to replicate the Bank of England and then also replicate uh, Germany's bank, which had failed. So in the decades since the creation of the Federal Reserve, these banking cartels have maintained and expanded their power. The Federal Reserve has been responsible for numerous economic crises, crises uh, including the Great Depression, inflation in the 1970s, uh, the 2008 financial crisis, and this just shows that the slavery to this fake debt is so detrimental to us as Americans and the world because the dollar still is the global reserve currency, and um, which I don't think it will be for long. And it's not good. It's just not good. So that's kind of the... That's where it all started. I would say that this all really, really started in 1913 and, and how they started to devalue the dollar. So we were still technically pegged to silver and gold from 1913 until 1971. But the way that they started to devalue money, devalue currency, is they would take these what used to be almost pure silver and gold and let's say one ounce was... One dollar. Let's just make it easy. An ounce was a dollar. So you got a dollar silver piece or a $20 gold piece. Well, how do we make it to where it looks like a gold piece that's worth $20 or looks like a silver piece that's worth a dollar? They started adding metals in to devalue the amount of silver that's in it. So it went from pure silver, pure gold, or, you know, 0.999. Uh, so 99.9% or, or <laughs> gold, 99.9% .9 silver, and they started adding in other metals. Well, now it's only 90% silver. Well, that very quickly starts to devalue silver and gold. Well, then in 1971, Nixon temporarily took us off the gold standard. But we know that anything in government that's temporary is not temporary, such as the TSA. That was temporary. But you know that every time you go through security, it's more and more and more locked down. Anything government is not temporary, including uh, going away from the gold standard. So this all obviously started in 1913, but if we want to just kind of go through a timeline of how this all happened. The system was working okay until the 1960s when the U.S. began importing Volkswagens from Germany and Toyotas from Japan. And suddenly the U.S. was importing more than it was exporting and gold was leaving our country. 
So in order to stop the loss of gold, President Nixon ended the Brenton Woods system, which was a system that was in place uh, pre-1971, and the U.S. dollar replaced gold as the world's currency. This had never been done in the history of one's nation, uh, where fiat currency had been created uh, that quickly and really by one person. Uh, I don't know if it was an executive order or what it was, but all of a sudden, boom, it was uh, changed from the gold standard to a fiat currency, which is where they can print as much as they want. So let's talk about that a little bit. What is fiat money? Uh, it's essentially paper money, and it's not convertible into coin or something of equivalent value. Now, back in the day, the dollars would say, hey, you can go trade this in for actual physical silver or gold. So it's not convertible into coin. It is fiat. So if you ever hear of fiat currency, it just means currency that can be uh, created out of thin air. So essentially, when we were taken off the gold standard, we started using fake money. President Nixon took us off the, the gold standard and the U.S. dollar became fake money. And to really understand that, you've got to look at some charts from, let's just say, from the, the 1900s. Uh, and if you base that off of gold, you can really see that every single fiat currency has lost 98 or 99 percent of its value. The yen has lost it, the dollar has lost it, the euro has lost it, and it's, it's just the way that it is. Now, if you were to take, this is actually kind of interesting, I believe it's that if you take three nickels pre-1964, when they were actually still 90% silver, and you take the actual silver content out of them, what that's worth today is a gallon of gas. But back in the day, that 15 cents was a gallon of gas. So the value of the dollar has gone way down, but the value of silver has not. Silver and gold, although they are mined and we, we do add to the supply, it's not added nearly as quickly as we can add fiat currency. And so the values are the same. So the money that we thought of as money is no longer money. Most people think of the dollar as money, but in reality, it is not. Uh, a, a great way to look at this is to realize that you can buy $10,000 in cash from the U.S. Bureau of Engraving and Printing for only $45. Uh, that's cash that, that they've shredded. It's, I mean, that's just a, a kind of a weird way of looking at it, but it just shows that dollars are nothing. Now, yes, we pay for everything in dollars, but it doesn't mean that that's the best system to go by. And when we learn and grow and grow up and we just learn that things are how they are. Now, I'm going to shift this a little bit. I am not a flat earther. I am an I don't know her. So is the earth round? Probably. But I've started asking people just randomly for fun. Hey, is the earth round? And everybody goes, well, yeah, absolutely. And I say, how do you know that? And almost every single person goes, well, I don't know, but that's what I've learned. And go, okay, that's cool. And it's nothing against people. This is just how we're, we're brought up. You know, what have you learned? And why do you truly believe the people that are teaching you what they're teaching you? And nobody knows the answer. Because we're brought up in a system that just teaches us whatever they want us to know. And we never question things on our own. So in The Creature of Jekyll Island, he talks about how the name of the game is bailout. And that's how the Federal Reserve can pretty much create money in order to bail out these banks that are making bad decisions. Now, there's something else that's important. It's called quantitative easing. And that's a style of monetary stimulus <clears throat> by a central bank, which increases the monetary base. So what they do is they print money in order to uh, 
you could say stimulate the economy or bail these these places out but what you're doing is you're actually devaluing the dollar and you're bailing out companies that have made poor decisions it it doesn't make sense in the long run and really the common sense part of it really doesn't make sense <clears throat> so okay we know the history now we know the federal reserve we understand that we are not hooked to silver and gold anymore. Okay, what do we do? Well, a system like this, historically speaking, will only fail. Now, in my opinion, it has failed because the dollar's lost 98, 99% of its value. Now, most people don't see that or don't understand it or don't want to understand it because the idea of changing the system is very daunting. But the system doesn't need to be changed systemically in order for you to benefit from it. Now, I believe that the system will be systematically changed, but that's going to come out of necessity. They're going to continue to kick the can down the road until it just has to fail. The way they've been kicking the can down the road, we can even see within the last few years, is they print money and they give that out to citizens or they give it to banks. And that, this is also where it's crazy. There's something called the velocity of money. When a bank gets your money, that money is way more valuable to them than it is by the time that it gets to you. So let's say a bank gets a million dollars. Well, that money's worth whatever that currency is worth, whatever it is at the time. Well, by the time it gets to you, it's actually lost value plus they're charging you interest, and the Federal Reserve, who created that money, is increasing that interest rate to a point where nobody can buy a house, nobody can buy a car, and then our money that's sitting in the bank is losing value at double-digit inflation right now. So will the system fail? I do believe that it will fail. Will another reserve currency come along and replace the dollar? I do believe that that will happen. Uh, it's actually very possible there's a currency that's being created by Iran and China and Russia right now uh, that's going to be silver and gold backed. Uh, China, Russia, and Iran, they don't want to be run by the dollar. They don't want to be run by the petrodollar. So they want to create something on their own. Well, we've been exporting and selling off our gold for years. You know, we used to have Fort Knox where all this gold was. Uh, it's not confirmed that we have any gold in there anymore. We've been selling it off for a long time. Now, you know, even pre-Brenton Woods, if you think about that, uh, we started importing Volkswagens and Toyotas. A lot of our gold was leaving the United States. So I actually think that the system will turn into another reserve currency from somebody else. Uh, but until then, what do we do? <sighs> this is kind of the fun part for me because, uh, cause, well, okay, it's just fun. It's, uh, it's fun for me. So we doll and this is the easiest way to do it so if anyone's listening to this and it's like okay cool well the system sucks what do we do we could get deep into options trading and and um real estate and and, and try to make good plays here and there but in the last few minutes here i just want to give the most solid easiest way to have the long game in mind and try to win in the long game. Now, <clears throat> we know, we know through studies that delayed gratification is the number one indicator of success. So there's that story of a teacher that gave like a marshmallow to each kid and said, if you can wait 10 minutes, I'll give you another marshmallow. Teacher leaves the room. Some kids are like, sweet, another marshmallow. I'm not eating this marshmallow. And then other kids are like, man, I've got to have this marshmallow right now. So they eat the marshmallow. Other kids don't. <clears throat> Teacher comes back in. The kids who didn't eat the marshmallow, they get another marshmallow. I think she did this three or four times. And then, and I have not corroborated the story, so I've heard it several times, but I hope it's true. Uh, but it makes a good point either way. Then they follow these kids throughout their life, and they find that the ones who were willing to wait for the next marshmallow were the most successful in life. And I would imagine when they talk success, they're talking financial success. Delayed gratification is where it's at. 
So when I first started to get into cryptocurrency, it was pretty crazy because, you know, you'd put in a hundred bucks and you'd be like, oh my goodness, it went up 10%. So I made 10%, I made $10 off of this money. And then three days later, it's down 20%. I'm like, oh crap, we're going to lose all of our money. We're, we're down $10, but we were up $10. What, what do I do? Well, years later, I don't care what the market does today. Because every day in a certain, cur- a certain cryptocurrency, every week in another certain cryptocurrency, and every month in another certain cryptocurrency, and once a month with silver and gold... We just buy a certain amount. I don't care what the market does. It could be up. It could be down. It does not matter. Over the past three years, we've done this with Bitcoin and have accumulated a decent amount of Bitcoin because it goes in no matter what. Sometimes I look at the account and it's down. Sometimes I look at the account and it's up. But if you think of what's going to happen, what is happening, what has happened since 1913 and especially since 1971, if the value of the dollar continues to go down, which means they're adding to the supply, which they will continue to do, it's part of the system, it it is what they do, then the value of silver, gold, and Bitcoin slash cryptocurrency and real estate will only go up in relation to the dollar. It will only go up in relation to the dollar. So if you're purchasing assets right now at a certain cost and your Bitcoin continues to raise, then you will be able to pay off those assets much, much easier. Now, the name of this game is delayed gratification. We have to delay that gratification because we, most people, can't start a business and make a million dollars within the next month. Well, although that would be cool, you know what I would do with that million dollars? I'd probably be putting it into silver, gold, Bitcoin, and real estate. Because over the next 10, 15, 20 years, they can only go up. Unless there's a complete systemic change in our monetary system, in which case, great. Then I've got some silver, gold, Bitcoin, and and uh in real estate that I can do something else with. Um, the, the values of those aren't going down. They're usable. You can use silver. Silver is used in electric cars. Silver is used in circuit boards. Silver is used all over the place. Uh, same with gold. Um, I don't know if they do gold fillings anymore, but they should because that would be cool. That would be a great way to store your gold in your mouth. Okay, I digressed. Um, dollar cost averaging is what this is called. I would urge all people, this is just me though, but I would urge all people to start dollar cost averaging into all of these things. So I use a subscription from bullion box. Uh, I wish I had like some discount code that I could give you for bullion box, but We get a monthly subscription to silver and gold, and I love it so much. It's like Christmas, about the 15th of every single month, and uh, it's amazing. So we just store physical silver and gold in a very secure location, in several secure locations, and um, it's awesome. It's so great, and I also have gotten into just collectible coins and old coins, and it's just fun. But then I see the value of that going up. Now, silver and gold hasn't changed a lot uh, over the last few years. And so that's actually been used against silver and gold. They're like, well, the value is not raising, but the value of Bitcoin is. Okay, let's say the value's only gone up, you know, 5, 10, 15%. What has the value of the dollar done? It's gone down 5, 10, 15%. So as the dollar is losing money, the silver is just showing that it's maintaining value. Its store of value is solid. So bullion box subscriptions is what I use for silver and gold. And it's awesome and I definitely recommend it. Uh, What we use for Bitcoin is swanbitcoin.com. Now on this one, I actually do have a referral code. So each person that signs up for this will receive $10 free of Bitcoin, 
which, hey, it's like, hey, $10, is that even worth it? Well, I don't know. You tell me. What happens in 15 years when Bitcoin is worth um, $10 million and right now it's only worth 25 That $10 is sure going to become a lot of, uh, a lot of money, currency. So if you go to swanbitcoin.com slash coach Tyler M, use that referral link, swanbitcoin.com slash coach Tyler M. Sign up, you'll get $10 of, of free Bitcoin. I don't know if I get anything from it, but I don't really care. I want to see my friends and family and listeners thrive over their lifetime. And I truly believe that this is one way that, they, that, that you can make this happen. The other thing is I think we're about to see a 2008 style crash in the banking system and in real estate and want to urge all of you to start learning how to get access to enough money to buy cash flowing real estate assets. Uh, we don't have a lot of these. Uh, this is something that I want to get into more, but we have made a couple uh, very lucky, good feeling deals that have allowed us to cash flow real estate. I will never retire. My plan is not to be 65 and not doing anything. We will probably always own some type of cash flowing asset or several that is where our retirement comes from. I don't care if we have 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars in the bank when I retire. What I care about is that we have 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars worth of real estate that's paying us uh, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars a month. That's what's important to me. Then before we die or as we die, that gets transferred to kids only if they have learned the true principles of money and value creation. Uh, but that's our plan. And, and in all the research that I've done over all of the years, and I've tried so many different things, that is the easiest, most solid way to invest. Now, this could also be done in stocks, but I'm not, I'm not completely sold on stocks right now. I actually feel like the stock market itself uh, isn't so much going to crash, but it is going to be tokenized on a blockchain, which is awesome because I love blockchain. I think it is the future. So Bitcoin is blockchain technology, uh, essentially unhackable blockchain technology. Well, the same thing can start to happen within the stock market. So you're actually buying tokens on the blockchain within these stocks. So you could dollar cost average into stocks, but me personally, I would wait a little bit on that. But I would dollar cost average into silver. I would dollar cost average into gold. I would dollar cost average into uh, Bitcoin. And then as those assets raise, we could take that and move that over into real estate. Now, I love the word real estate because it's talking that it's real. I know it's very simple, but it's real. It's tangible. It's there. You can stand on it. You can build on it. You can drill on it. You can mine on it. You can sell your mineral mineral rights on it. You can get water from underground in it. It's amazing. So that's it for today. I just wanted to chat about the history, why it's important, what we can do about it. The system may not change right now, but your idea of money and currency can change right now, and it will blow you away how quickly you can start to accumulate these things. Like I said, we use Swan Bitcoin, and I'm, I'm not really not trying to push this, but I would like you guys to get you know $10 of free Bitcoin. So swanbitcoin.com slash coach Tyler M. Uh, sign up and start doing it. Uh, you're just putting a certain amount of money in at a certain uh, either daily, weekly, monthly, or bi-monthly or whatever you want. It's blown me away over the last few years when I hop on that account and see how much Bitcoin that we've accumulated. Now, you know, full disclosure, it's not millions and millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin, but it's enough Bitcoin that when Bitcoin hits 15 million in 10 years, it will be millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. And um, it doesn't mean that we put millions in. It means that we put a few hundred in every month. And it doesn't have to be a few hundred. You could put 50 bucks in a month. You could put $25 in a month. But whatever you're doing is going to compound over time. 
um, a, a nice, I've got a friend and we disagree on, on some monetary policy and bank stuff and everything. And he was talking about the power of compound interest yesterday. And, um, I, I agree. Compound interest is absolutely incredible, but I don't trust the systems that are in place. I know too many people that are retired right now with a 401k and a pension that can't live the lifestyle that they're supposed to be able to live when they're retired. And that's because the system has failed them. Our government has failed them. We've put trust in the government in order to make sure that we're okay when we're older. And that can't happen because the government doesn't know. There, that's the biggest, that's a big fallacy. And we don't need to get into this, but this is something I'm really passionate about. We put trust in these people thinking that they know the best when they don't. They know very little more than us or they know less than us. I actually feel the same way with financial planners. And it's nothing against financial planners, but if you look at what they're producing versus what I can produce with just very little education, I have probably, well, we don't need to get into numbers. I've just done a little bit better than what a financial planner can do. Now, if you're going to look for a financial planner, that's totally fine, but find one that is non-fiduciary. Find one that is not hooked to a system that they can't give you good advice. Uh, find one that, you know, if they believe in Bitcoin, they go, hey, here's the safest way to get Bitcoin. Here's the safest way to get Ethereum. You can take that Bitcoin. You can take that Ethereum. You can take that Cardano. You can put it on a, on a ledger. You can put it in a safe place. It's got a 27-word password that you can store in 15 different places, and you can restore your account and always have access to that to that Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, or whatever cryptocurrency that you're looking into. I am now just ranting, so we are going to be done. The Federal Reserve is not your friend. Central banks are not our friend. Centralized control is not our friend. We have to take responsibility, 100% responsibility of our life. I've got a book here, The Success Principles by Jack Canfield. The number one, chapter number one, take 100 responsibility. 100% responsibility of your life and be clear why you're here. Decide what you want. Believe it's possible. Believe in yourself. Become an inverse paranoid. Chunk it down. Release the brakes. Act as if. Take action. Lean into it. Make all of this stuff happen. You don't have to become an expert at it immediately, but you do need to start now, today, and make some decisions and stand by those decisions. And if they're wrong, learn from them, but take control of your own monetary life and thrive. That, like I said, this is what I want for my family and friends and listeners and everybody. I believe that we can all thrive. We can be wealthy in all areas of our life. We can be wealthy in money. We can be wealthy in, uh, in, our, in our jobs, in our businesses, in our relationships, in our emotions, in our spirituality. We can be wealthy in everything as long as you can take responsibility now and learn from your mistakes. We either win or we learn or we win, learn together. So I hope you guys have a great day. Hope you got a little bit of something out of this. <clears throat> if there's something that intrigues you about this that we want to jump into a little bit more, please reach out and let me know. Also, if anybody knows of anyone who knows the history of this stuff better than I do, which I'm sure there are many people out there, I would love to take them on the podcast and chat with them. Part of the idea of this podcast is just exposing good people. I want good, awesome people that I can learn from. This is kind of a selfish podcast in that regard. I want to just talk with successful people and learn from them and use them as my coaches and my mentors and then transfer that out to you guys. Done with the rant. Have a great day. Love you guys. And we will chat soon.